Uh, my name is uh, Valentine uh, uh, Moradam, Mirza Moradam, um, if you want the true Persian pronunciation. I was born in Iran. Um, I'm a professor of sociology and international affairs at Northeastern University, uh, which I joined in January of 2012. And before that, I was at Purdue University. Before that, I was with UNESCO in Paris. Before that, I was at Illinois State University. And before that, I was with the United Nations University Wider Institute in Helsinki. So my career has gone back and forth between UN and academia. I am now back in academia to stay. Um, and um, I unfortunately am not able to teach courses on the Middle East at Northeastern University, but um, I do a lot of research um, and also advocacy work um, on, um, on the region. Um, and uh, one of the things that really has been troubling me uh, recently is um, the, um, um, the decline and the destruction, actually, we can call it that, of the Middle East. Um, uh, frankly, since the Arab Spring, and, and our, our hopes were very high um, in early 2011 um, uh, with, the, with the Arab Spring, and the idea was that there might be democratization flourishing throughout the region and so on, but that didn't come to pass. And one reason it did not come to pass, except for one country called Tunisia, um, is uh, precisely because of outside interference and intervention. Um, and the reason, actually, that Tunisia is the one country uh, that uh, was involved in um, the Arab Spring and managed actually to institute a democratic transition and it's doing fairly well. It now has pretty robust democratic institutions, a very thriving um, uh, feminist uh, a set of feminist organizations and so on, is that Tunisia was off the radar screen of all the major uh, Western powers. Um, and so there was no external intervention into um, Tunisia. And so its um, political revolution and its democratic transition was allowed to proceed organically without any outside interference. Whereas if you think about Libya, Bahrain, Syria, and Yemen, that was not allowed to occur for various reasons, um, oil being um, the most important uh, reason for these countries. Um, uh, but, um, but what I want to talk about today is, is Yemen. Um, I want to, uh, to talk a little bit about something that I'm sure that quite a few of you are aware of, the dreadful humanitarian uh, crisis over there. Um, this is a situation in which the richest country um, in the region is bombing the heck out of and destroying the poorest country in the region. Um, and um, actually, there's very little that is being said about that, um, although all the media, this sort of unrelenting, biased media attention, is all on Syria um, and what the Syrian government is purportedly um, doing to its own people um, with, you know, supposedly with chemical warfare and so on, and none of that has been proven yet. Um, but that's the way uh, the media work, and that's the way our politicians work too, uh, which is they decide um, what becomes important and what becomes outrageous and what we have to focus our um, energy and um, attention and condemnation on. And so um, Saudi Arabia has just left, let off the hook. Um, and I wanted to also give you a little bit of a background on um, uh, Yemen as well, because um, Yemen has a very interesting story, and I'd like to tell you about that. And by the way, I saw a lady who actually had my, um, a copy of my presentation. I don't know, has anyone here actually received a copy of the written? Okay, then, then I'll feel comfortable about um, you know, giving you the full full story. I do have a PowerPoint presentation, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a background um, to Yemen too, which some of you might find um, quite interesting, especially about um, the southern part of, of Yemen. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me first uh, just remind you where um, Yemen is uh, located. Um, so here's a map of the region, and uh, you know I'm sorry if this is a little simplistic to many of you who know exactly uh, where Yemen is and what we're talking about. Um, but uh, you know it is a country to the south of uh, Saudi Arabia, um, and um, um, on the uh, uh, Gulf of Aden. The the country used to be divided um, into north and south, and I'll give you a little bit of, uh, of that history in um, in a while. But there it is south of the behemoth um, Saudi Arabia. 
and, um, and you know, closer to um, the African um, continent too, and there used to be a lot of interaction, trade, and so on and so forth between um, Ethiopia, actually, and, and Yemen um, for, uh, you know, for, for various historic regions. So that is a map of um, the Middle East and parts of North Africa, just, um, you know, uh, Egypt, really. Um, and uh, most of the region is in turmoil. Um, and most of the, re and I think we're all aware of what happened in Iraq with, um, you know, the American um, and British um, invasion and occupation in uh, 2003, which, uh, you know, led really to the devastation in that country and led to a civil war which had never happened before, you know. So, um, and then, you know, the, the rise of all these different types of terrorists and so on. Um, and, um, and Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia are currently, of course, um, in very intensive competition with each other, but it's a kind of a manufactured composition too. Um, and it's not one that Iran started. Now, I, I want to say that just because I was born in Iran doesn't mean that um, you know, I'm, I'm biased and prejudiced, um, because in fact, I hold them responsible for um, the atrocities that occurred actually after the um, uh, Islamic Revolution um, and um, the kinds of uh, repression that occurred and the uh, um, atrocities um, to the leftists in, in particular. Um, but um, I do um, uh, you know, have to admit that they are not responsible for the competition and rivalry that is going on in the region. That is something that Saudi Arabia, backed by the United States, and most recently by Israel, has decided is important. Um, that Saudi Arabia um, should become the dominant um, you know, Muslim-majority country in the region and not Iran. So Iran and Saudi Arabia are these two larger, richer, you know, et cetera, uh, you know, countries. Um, and, um, and it has been decided that um, <coughs> Iran needs to be sidelined and, um, uh, and Saudi Arabia has to become the dominant, um, the dominant uh, power there. Um, and, um, and then, of course, we have Syria, which, uh, you know, started out with some you know, demonstrations and protests in early 2011 too. They were put down by the regime. But before you know it, the, uh, you know, the rest of the world is condemning um, Assad and um, at the same time condemning also uh, Gaddafi in, in Libya. And so the mantra, Assad must go, Gaddafi must go, um, was heard around the world. And of course, there was all this external intervention. Um, Gaddafi um, uh, was overthrown in you know, rather a brutal way. And that country did not exactly become a beacon of democracy or even stability, um, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, that has also become a failed state. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, Iraq, which was destroyed by the 2003 invasion and occupation. Um, and it is still struggling with all kinds of problems. Libya, which is a failed state. Yemen, which is a failed state. Um, Saudi Ar Arabia, which quite apart from the fact that over the past 30, 35 years, it has been spreading Wahhabi Islam all over the world. Not only the Muslim world, but also European countries building the most conservative types of mosques and madrasas and so on and so forth for um, you know, Muslim citizens of, of Western countries to attend. Um, uh, most recently, it has been trying to uh, destroy um, Yemen and the rebels there, and also trying to destroy the Assad regime. Um, and, um, and, and that is part of its agenda to, um, to become the dominant uh, partner in the region with the full collaboration and support of the United States and also Israel. So it's a very, very serious and dangerous situation in the region. I grew up in Iran. I have never in my life felt as despondent um, about the situation in the Middle East um, as, as, as I have been over the past um, few years. It's, it's a very, very critical, very serious uh, time. Um, so um, there is our, um, our map. Of, um, of, of little Yemen and um, the behemoth on, on top of it. And uh, there is Iran and Tehran, which is where I was born, um, and uh, Tabriz, Lake Urumia, which is where my um, father's side of the family um, are from. So let me get to, to Yemen. What I'd like to do then is um, you know, talk about the, the crisis, go a little bit into um, the, uh, the background, the history of Yemen, 
and um, and then um, um, and uh, and then end it, and then we can have um, you know a, a little discussion afterwards too. And I'm happy to to hear from you about that. But first, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Yemen, um, especially Sanaa the capital city, um, which at one time was the capital city just of the north, um, is very famous for these sort of gingerbread uh, looking um, houses. Very, very charming um, types. So this is the traditional housing um, in, in Sana'a. Um, and uh, you know, this is another angle. Um, you know, very, very charming. Um, but later on, we'll, we'll look at um, how so much of this has actually been destroyed by the aerial bombardments of, of the Saudis. Okay, so um, now when did that begin? That began in February of um, 2015 when um, a Saudi-led coalition of Arab states launched um, a campaign of airstrikes against Houthi targets um, and gradually it just uh, besieged the entire country of Yemen. The relentless bombardments since then have turned Yemen into one of the worst um, humanitarian crises of modern times. Seven million Yemenis are close to famine. Nearly two million children are suffering from acute malnutrition, and an outbreak of cholera has affected about 600,000 people. This horrific situation is the result of Saudi, um, UAE, um, etc., bombing of roads, hospitals, bridges, water and sewage facilities, and the main port of Hodeida combined with a um, naval and air blockade that prevents large-scale humanitarian assistance from reaching the Yemeni war uh, victims. And it should be noted that the Saudis use sophisticated weaponry that is largely supplied by the United States and by Britain, uh, which is why those two countries have not criticized Saudi Arabia's war crimes. I mean, some of the left-wing media have done, people like we um, uh, have, have done so, but not the uh, major politicians. Um, so 10 countries are involved in that so-called Saudi-led um, uh, uh, co uh, coalition, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, U uh, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Morocco, um, Jordan, Sudan, and Pakistan, you know, at various uh, you know, levels, airspace, weapons, or what have you, soldiers too or pilots and such. Um, the conflict has been described as exemplifying the Sunni-Shia rivalry. Um, and the Houthis have been constructed as this pro-Iranian, Iranian-supported Shia group. It ain't true, actually. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> um, and, um, and it is cast as um, uh, you know, the result of rivalry between Saudi Arabia, which um, you know, supported the previous president, Mansour Hadi, and the Houthi rebels, who are said to be supported by Iran. Um, you know, it is true that after the bombardment started in February of 2015, the Iranians, of course, condemned the Saudis for that. But they were not supplying weapons and they never gave the Houthis weapons at the beginning. The Houthis have gotten most of their weapons actually from police, the, the Houthis, mainly from the police and the army barracks that they have taken over in, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in Yemen. Um, but it is true that um, more recently, um, just as Iran finally said enough with all of this intervention in Syria, which by the way started in the latter part of 2011, the Iranians and the Russians uh, intervened in 2015 in Syria. Um, more recently, they are helping out the Houthi rebels because of this uh, relentless, constant bombardment of the country on the part of Saudi Arabia. But they were not there at the beginning. And in fact, there is some very good research showing that Iran actually counseled the Houthis not to try to take over, but they did. Okay. Um, so um, the conflict actually is uh, one reason why um, the Iranians were trying to counsel the Houthis not to, uh, you know, to try to take over is because the conflict is really um, part of a long, decades-long inter-tribal conflict. In, uh, in Yemen. The tribal um, politics of Yemen are 
rather complicated and um, complex, and I don't want to get into, um, uh, into the details uh, there very much. But uh, you know, it's, it's enough to know that, um, um, and I will explain this a little bit later on, that there was an outbreak um, uh, you know, earlier on in this century. Um, a leader of this one group called Al-Houthi was, um, was killed. And there was this simmering animosity and anger towards the central government of, um, uh, of, uh, of Yemen. And so it was just a matter of time before the Houthis actually decided to rebel. And that's what they did. Um, so, um, and actually I want to quote um, uh, a scholar who's, who's a, a historian and happens to be from Israel, by the way, but a very, very good um, scholar and, and historian and, and very balanced in his, um, in his view of, of the situation there. Um, he, he writes that, um, that only an internal Yemeni political settlement can end the war. In other words, Saudis out, this, you know, 10 other countries out, then the Iranians out, etc., and let the Yemenis themselves decide how to resolve their conflicts, hostilities, animosities, etc., which by the way should have happened in Syria too. You see. Otherwise we would not have had this, you know, 8-year-long internationalized civil conflict. Not to mention Iraq, of course, yes. Um, so um, I want to now uh, move on to uh, provide a kind of an overview of Yemen's history, the status of women, something near and dear to my heart, how Yemen was affected by the Arab Spring and the disaster that has befallen the country. So after years of colonial rule from Great Britain, 1962 marked a turning point. In September of 62, um, Imam Ahmad bin Yahya Hamidian died and was succeeded by his son, who was then uprooted by rebels who had formed the Yemen Arab Republic, launching North Yemeni independence from Britain. This sparked what was known as the North Yemen Civil War between the Royalists, who were supported by Saudis, and the Republicans, backed by um, uh, Egypt. This conflict lasted sporadically until 1967, when the Egyptian group, the troops were removed to fight um, um, in the, uh, the Arab-Israeli War. And in November of that same year, and following five years of violence, the British protectorate was pushed out of southern Yemen. And in 1967, that year, the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen was formed, the PDRY. So Yemen was divided into two. North Yemen was the Yemen Arab Republic, Y-A-R. South Yemen was the Socialist Marxist People's Democratic Republic of um, Yemen. Um, uh, whose capital was Aden, the port city um, of, um, of Aden. And the PDRY came to be known as um, the Cuba of the Middle East. In uh, November of 1967, the National uh, Liberation Front came to power and declared the PDRY. It quickly set about launching a modernization project in a country that lacked a unified national economy, a political structure, and a legal system. The 1970 Constitution called its revolution an alliance between the working class, the peasants, intelligentsia, and petty bourgeoisie. Adding that, and again I'm quoting from that Constitution, soldiers, women, and students are regarded as part of this alliance by virtue of their membership in the productive forces of the people. Oh, that language, I'm so nostalgic for it. The PDRY came to be known as um, the Cuba of the Middle East. Now, in contrast to what was happening, so the South is the progressive part, the North is the reactionary conservative part. In contrast to what was occurring in the North, the National Liberation Front, the ruling party at the time of, of uh, um, Southern Yemen, moved to enhance the legal status and social positions of women. The Constitution outlined the government's policies toward women, and a new family law, 
was uh, pr proposed in 1971 and passed, adopted in 1974. The family law of southern Yemen became among the most forward-looking and emancipatory in the Middle East, rivaling that of Tunisia, which at the time was the most progressive um, of, uh, of all the Arab uh, world. It established the principle of free choice marriage, it raised the minimum legal age of marriage to 16 for girls and um, 18 for boys. And this in a country where child, female child marriage was quite prevalent. It abolished polygamy except in exceptional circumstances. Um, and it reduced the mahr, the dower, um, not dowry, but the dower which goes from groom to bride, um, which oftentimes actually put households um, in debt, in huge debt. Um, and it ended unilateral male divorce, and it increased divorced women's rights to custody of their children. So this was the southern Yemeni um, family law, very progressive for its time. So women were given the right to vote in 1970, when universal suffrage was implemented. And by 1977, women candidates were competing for electoral office as well as working in factories, handicraft cooperatives, and the local defense militia. Uh, much assistance for the PDRY came from the socialist bloc, and especially the Soviet Union. The General Union of Yemeni Women, which was formed in 1968, mobilized women throughout the PDRY and was especially active in monitoring and promoting the family law. A women's conference held 10 years after the family law sought to assess the progress that it had made for women legally and socially. It was acknowledged at that 1984 uh, conference that many women had indeed benefited from the government's policies and especially the family law, but that there was a lag between the law and cultural practices um, and that cultural values and norms remained conservative and that more time would be needed for um, the family law to be, and these you know, new and liberal and progressive values to be fully integrated um, uh, into, into the population. But unfortunately, um, the PDRY's time and its socialist modernizing uh, project were limited. Um, so the North and South Yemen remained um, quite hostile, as, as you can imagine, because the North was very conservative, allied to Saudi Arabia, and um, also you know, part of the Western capitalist bloc, so to speak, um, or in the language of the day, the imperialist bloc. <laughs> um, and Southern Yemen was um, part of the global socialist bloc. So, of course, there was a lot of um, animosity at the time. Fighting erupted between the North and South in October 1972, when North Yemen, supported by Saudi Arabia, and the South by the USSR. But the two countries did um, reach a, a unification agreement later that, that month. And the late 1980s brought interest in unification with an eye to oil exploration near the border of the two countries with a view to enhancing both economies. Now, this was happening in the late 1980s. Uh, remember what the context, the global context was in the late 1980s. Um, you had um, the Soviet Union being sort of mired in the Afghanistan war. And the Afghanistan war was, of course, um, um, led by these uh, tribal Islamist uh, alliance called the Mujahideen, which was actually supported by the United States. So Afghanistan had this revolution in April of 1978, which brought about um, compulsory schooling for girls. And that was one reason why there was a rebellion by the fathers, who just didn't want their daughters to have any kind of schooling whatsoever. Um, and, um, and the United States decided that um, communism was a worse enemy than Islamism. <clears throat> OK, I think we. Um, can agree that that was a serious mistake. I mean, look at what Afghanistan is today. Um, it had that one window of opportunity, because I've studied Afghanistan a great deal, and I was actually there in 1989 as well. There was that one window of opportunity for that country to finally come into the 20th century, um, let alone today, the 21st century. Uh, when I visited there, there were very few paved roads. There was no railroad, for example. 
I mean, I was looking at it through Iranian eyes, and Iran is just next door to Afghanistan. Iran was so much more developed, both in terms of schooling and health and road construction. My father, my late father, was in the Ministry of Roads and Transportation in Iran, and there was road building and electrification all over Iran. None of that was going on in Afghanistan. But, of course, had that left-wing government been allowed <laughs> to carry out its agenda of modernization, infrastructural development, compulsory schooling for girls, etc., had the United States decided not to undermine that project by sending weapons to the Mujahideen via Pakistan, and of course Saudi Arabia was also um, uh, taking part, and a few Saudis, including one with the name of Osama bin Laden, trained in um, a CIA camp in Afghanistan at the time. Um, had that not occurred, we would have had a more developed Afghanistan, and we would not have had Al-Qaeda. Thank you, America. OK, Reagan, um, uh, the Reagan uh, uh, regime. Um, right. So. Um, oh, so that was the global context, right. The global context is one where you have this sort of slow decline of the Soviet Union. Gorbachev comes in in 1985, um, and um, you know, Reagan had said he wanted to create a Vietnam for the Soviet Union and Afghanistan, and actually he did by throwing weapons um, you know, via um, Pakistan into uh, Afghanistan. And um, the Soviet Union, of course, pulls out of Afghanistan. And by that time, um, the country was, um, the, the Soviet state was kind of bankrupt. And then before you know it, you have, of course, um, uprisings throughout um, Eastern Europe, and then also in the Soviet Union, and then you have the collapse of communism. So with the collapse of communism, of course, I think a lot of you in, in, in this room realize that you know, Cuba also went through um, a very serious period. Um, Nicaragua went through a serious period and it's pulled itself up pretty, pretty nicely um, now, actually. Um, and then, so did Yemen. So, so uh, Southern Yemen, that was to say, the PDRY. And it's in that context, in that late, latter part of the 1980s, and especially the 1988, 89, that um, South Yemen decides, um, agrees to unite with Northern Yemen. It was bad news for women, but. Um, the Unified Republic of Yemen was declared on the 22nd of May in 1990, with Ali Abdullah Saleh becoming the head of state, and he stayed head of state right until 2011. Uh, but it wasn't long, long before uh, tensions swelled again. After a new oil field was opened up in the south, many southerners perceived unification to have been a northern conspiracy to acquire the south's land and resources. In addition, Yemen's decision not to support coalition forces in the US-led Gulf War, so we're talking about 1991, resulted in an estimated 800,000 Yemeni nationals and overseas workers being sent home by Saudi Arabia and placed in refugee camps by the Yemeni government. OK, so much for pan-Arab um, unity. Um, where they uh, added to the problems of high unemployment and poverty. The unification uh, process, therefore, was a very difficult one. So the combination of the externally um, generated problems, along with problems associated with transition and integration of government, bureaucracy, and militaries, resulted in tensions that would jeopardize the country in the uh, years following. In August of 1993, the vice president of the new unified state uh, left the north for Aden to protest what he deemed to be unfair treatment of the south, and he suggested that he and the president resign. The president decided not to resign, and so there was uh, an outbreak of fighting between the north and the south in 1994. Um, most of the actual fighting in that 1994 civil war took place in the southern part of Yemen, and there were air and missile attacks carried out against some of the major cities in the north, such as Sana'a and Taiz. And this civil war ultimately ended in um, Aden when, uh, in July, when Aden, the capital of, of the south, was captured by the north and resistance um, seized. 
So this two-month um, civil war also decimated what was now called the Yemeni Socialist Party. Um, and so, you know, for all practical purposes, Yemen, unified Yemen, became, um, you know, a single party country. Um, so there was supposedly um, a party called the General Congress Party, and then it unites with the Islamic Islah Party, but then the Islah Party, the Islamic Islah Party, really becomes the um, uh, dominant party um, in Yemen. And it's a very, very conservative um, Islamist party. Um, so again, the context is important. So this is happening in 1994. What else is happening in 1994? Islamist parties are growing throughout the Middle East. Um, and actually, they're, you know, um, Islamic fundamentalism is also growing in, you know, within Muslim communities in Western countries as well. So this is the sort of a global and regional context in which the um, uh, Yemeni Socialist Party is marginalized and then eventually it all but disappears and the Isla, Islamist Party becomes uh, the dominant party. I mean, that was happening in a lot of the uh, Middle Eastern uh, countries. Meanwhile, all of the South's previous legal frameworks, including the family law, were annulled. During the 1990s, in fact, so in the 1990s I, I was working at my first UN job um, and I would be attending these UN uh, seminars and conferences in you know, Europe and Middle East and various other places. And I could always tell um, which of the Yemeni women were from the north and which were from the south. The women from the south had this flowing hair and they wore you know, skirts above their knee. Um, so remember, this is still um, the early 1990s, all right. Um, and then the uh, representatives, the female representatives of the North were in full burqa, black, you couldn't see their faces. And I remember the very first time I saw one of these women who was eating and she had to pull her little, the, the little flap up and then put her spoon to her mouth and put it down. And I thought, ah, what does it smell like underneath there? Um, um, I mean, I wasn't, you know, I, we weren't brought up that way in Iran, so um, it was very, very surprising for me to see that. But eventually, those women from Yemen, from the south, with the flowing hair and the short skirts, you, you stopped seeing them because gradually they also started to veil themselves. Um, and so the kind of dress code that was very, very dominant in the north came actually to encompass the south as well. Yemen is comprised equally of uh, Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims. I'm having a nice discussion with Michelle earlier about um, the, the so-called you know, Catholics and Protestants of the Islamic world, so to speak. Um, and there are, of course, other um, sort of smaller Muslim groups, too, that you know, a lot of people have not heard of, Ismaili and uh, Ahmadiyyah and Alawit and so on. Um, but the two major branches of Islam around the world are Sunni and Shia. And um, Iraq has both, right? And in fact, Iraq is probably majority Shia, but we're not you know, entirely sure. Um, and, uh, and Yemen has many Shia as well as, um, as, well as, uh, um, as Sunni. Um, but the Houthis are a certain sect of Shia um, called uh, the Zaidi. Um, so it's, it's I, I was giving um, you know, Michelle the example of, uh, you know, you have like Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses and you know, this sort of thing within uh, like American Christianity. So you know, these are some of the smaller um, you know, sects and such that you might have um, in, in the Muslim world as well. Um, so just uh, to point out that Yemen is comprised almost equally of, um, of you know, Shia and Sunni Muslims. It's the poorest and least developed country in the Middle East, and it has a tribal system that has been reinforced due to the state's failures uh, in development and, and security. You know, tribalism has been um, all but eradicated in Iran, let's say, and in other, um, you know, more developed, uh, you know, Middle Eastern countries, not, not Saudi Arabia, though. Um, you've got tribes in Jordan, you've got tribes in, in, um, in Iraq, but um, uh, tribes are still very uh, uh, dominant in, in Yemen, in part because it was never really fully uh, developed and modernized. I mean, it just wasn't given that opportunity to do so. I think that if southern Yemen, if the PDRY had continued, 
had been allowed to flourish and so on, um, it may have ended um, the, the tribalism there and we would have had more sort of modernization, infrastructural development, you know, et cetera, but that, that didn't happen. What did happen was that um, after the September 11th attacks in the U.S., President Saleh announced that Yemen would join the U.S. war um, on terror. And um, meanwhile, back in the 90s, um, Al-Qaeda, you know, which uh, was created by the Saudi man named Osama bin Laden, who had received some training in Afghanistan, um, uh, he had a group in uh, 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 Yemen also, and that group came to be known as Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, supporters of Al-Qaeda uh, remained in that area and um, in 2009, yeah, formed um, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. As that group expanded in numbers and operations, the Yemeni government increased military spending, reaching 7% of its GDP at one point. 7% of GDP is enormously high for any country. Um, I mean, at one point, the U.S. was spending 4% of its GDP on military, and that was considered the highest of all the industrialized countries, you see. Um, like, you know, Latin American countries spend like 1.2% of their GDP on military, you know. Tunisia spends only like 1.2, 1.5% of its GDP. The poorest country in the region, because it was part of the U.S. war on terror, was buying all this weaponry from the United States, which, by the way, now is in the hands of the Houthi rebels. Um, and um, it was spending between 4 and 7% of its GDP, which was very low to begin with, and that in a country that had very dire socioeconomic and, and health and um, uh, educational indicators. Child marriage, you know. Um, very high infant mortality, very high maternal mortality, very high illiteracy rate, kids dropping out of school, and so on and so forth. So um, in, 20, in 2009, the Obama administration announced a counterterrorism partnership with Saleh and began to launch drone strikes targeting multiple Al-Qaeda al uh, locations. Those strikes resulted in the killing of many Yemeni civilians. Dissatisfaction with the Saleh regime grew, especially but not exclusively on the part of Yemen's um, uh, uh, Zaidi Shia, whose leader al-Houthi, which I mentioned, had uh, led a rebellion in 2004 that had been crushed by government forces. So unified Yemen at the time, let's say uh, just before the Arab Spring, remained the poorest country in the Middle East with widespread illiteracy and malnutrition and a high rate of adolescent girl marriage, high fertility and high infant and child mortality. By the time the Arab Spring broke out, almost half of the population lived below, uh, below the poverty line and one third experienced um, chronic hunger. Uh, Yemen, by the way, also has one of the most heavily armed populations in the world and this is one of the features that it has in common with the United States. And that's also why the Houthi rebels are able to fight. Not because they get weapons from Iran, which they don't, but because the former president was buying all these weapons from the United States, and of course they've fallen into the hands of the Houthi rebels. So, um, the Arab Spring. Now in 2011, the outbreak of the Arab Spring in Tunisia and Egypt inspired protests in Yemen. Now remember, there was all this dissatisfaction with uh, Abdullah Saleh, the president, because of the high military spending, because of the poor um, social and um, you know, dem socio-demographic indicators, uh, you know, because of uh, his inability or unwillingness to improve the conditions in the country, poverty and so on and so forth. Um, so the Yemeni protests obviously were against the government's failings around those key issues in economic conditions, corruption, the Yemeni constitution. And so the protesters were calling on uh, President Saleh to resign and to step down from power. The Gulf uh, Cooperation Council, those Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, you know, et cetera, tried to mediate the conflict between Saleh and the people by drafting a proposal for the transfer of powers, but Saleh refused to co cooperate at that time. 
And at that point, uh, there was an uprising followed by an assassination attempt at the presidential palace 10 days after the start of the uprising. Saleh was attacked, he was uh, injured, and then he was sent to, um, to Saudi Arabia. Um, from there, he said that his vice president, Hadi, Mansour Hadi, would become the new president, but nobody in Yemen wanted him. And so the revolt um, just grew. The Houthis took control. <coughs> And um, in 2015, um, the uh, Saudis used that as, as an excuse to intervene, but I'm, I'm sort of um, going ahead of myself. So in September 2014, in the midst of this uprising against Saleh and this total dissatisfaction with this Mansour Hadi, the, the prime minister who has absolutely no legitimacy um, in the country, no popular support whatsoever, the only people he's supported by um, are the Saudis <laughs> and President Saleh who's over there um, and then he changed. Um, so in the midst of all of that, the Houthi rebels entered the capital city of Sana'a gaining full control by January of 2015. After the Houthi forces took the presidential palace along with other key areas, both President Hadi and his prime minister resigned, leading um, to the dissolution of parliament and the takeover of Houthi uh, militants as the governing body. Um, again, let me just uh, underscore this. Contrary to the claim uh, of the Saudis, and the Obama and Trump administrations. Iran actually advised the Houthis not to seize Sana'a, but they did. Um, in a challenge to mainstream opinion uh, pieces, um, um, Asher Orkabi, who's the Israeli um, um, historian that I mentioned earlier on, he has written that not only do the Houthis act independently of Iran, but they have no interest in confronting either the US or Israel. They just want to take over the country because they think they can do a better job of actually developing the country than any other government has done before. Well, I would say with the exception of you know, the PDRY um, back in, in, in the 70s. Okay, so um, the problem is the following. Um, the, you know, one month after the Houthis take over, the Saudis begin their aerial bombardments. By the way, they have no combat troops there. Um, you know, they're, they, uh, it, it's almost, it's, um, all they know how to do is drop bombs. And by the way, they don't even drop bombs properly because they hit all these civilian targets. You know, I mean, it's just appalling. Uh, the extent of the infrastructural damage and the killings of civilians that have occurred since the aerial bombardment started. Who's fighting on the ground? The Houthis. They're the ones who are actually engaged in combat, and it's, it's very, very difficult. Now, in the, uh, you know, the context of this vacuum, this political vacuum that has been created and all this chaos and such, of course, ISIS comes over. It was bad enough that we had al-Qaeda before, but now we have ISIS as well. And so they have gained some ground um, in Yemen, too. Um, the humanitarian crisis is gaining some international attention, but um, not enough. Um, again, most of the governments of the world are not paying enough attention. They don't care what Saudi Arabia does, and basically they're just allowing them to, um, you know, to do whatever the heck they want. What has happened with Saudi Arabia is, and I don't know if some of you, uh, you know, remember this about, was it about two years ago? Have you heard of the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child? So the Convention on the Rights of the Child also has an annual um, name and shame list of countries that are responsible for the violations of the rights of the child, including the killing you know, of, of children. Um, Saudi Arabia was put on that list. This was when Ban Ki-moon was still um, the, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, the Saudis actually blackmailed him and threatened that they would withdraw all the monies that they have um, you know, delivered for some other development programs here and there, um, if he did not remove uh, the name of Saudi Arabia from that list of countries that were responsible for um, child death and malnutrition and so on and so forth. And he did. And this was just such a disgraceful act on the part of the Secretary General, but it was also disgraceful on the part of all the countries that did not uh, criticize Saudi Arabia for that. 
Now, so um, the Saudi goal is not to permit a government friendly to Iran, as with, um, and you know, that's its goal in Syria as well. And at some point, I mean, I don't know, there might actually be, you know, some kind of attack on Lebanon, because of course you have Hezbollah in Lebanon, and the Saudis don't like them either. Um, so they seem to be, you know, very, very, um, a uh, very destructive force uh, in the region right now. But they also have another um, key interest, which interest aligns with that of the United States too, which is to have control over the um, oil shipping lanes. And remember I mentioned also that um, you know, Yemen, um, southern part of Yemen has, has oil as well. So a lot of it is about oil, a lot of it is also about just hegemony, just p control and power um, over the region. So, folks, we have, um, you know, our work cut out for us. Um, we uh, cannot um, um, allow Saudi Arabia to continue to uh, destroy uh, Yemen uh, and to destroy an entire population. And we should not also allow um, the government in this country, our government, our elected leaders, so on and so forth, uh, so to speak, um, to continue to arm Saudi Arabia. I think that is one of the big scandals of our time, is the fact that so many weapons, so many arms sales have been conducted, not only by Trump, but also the Obama administration, to Saudi Arabia. And this is one of the big scandals and, um, and, and outrages, I think, um, of our time. Um, and so I think we should really all raise our voices um, in protest. Thanks very much. <laughs>